So hello everyone and welcome to the last speaker seminar before the summer vacation. Uh, thank you for coming. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kenza Lamot. Uh, Dr. Lamot is a postdoctoral researcher and a visiting professor at the Department of Communication Studies and the Department of Political Science of the University of Antwerp. Uh, her research focus is on media and journalism uh, with digital journalism and audience engagement being the primary topic of her doctoral thesis for which she recently received the outstanding dissertation award from the International Communication Association. Uh, she's published on the use of metrics and analytics in journalism, and today she will present on the topic of metrics for news, the uses and effects of analytics in journalism. So thank you very much for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you for the nice introduction. I will quickly share my screen. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this presentation. Um, as uh, already introduced, my name is Jens Almot, and I'm currently a postdoc researcher in media and journalism studies at the University of Antwerp in Belgium, albeit not for a very long time anymore, as I will start a position as assistant professor in media and journalism study at the Free University of Amsterdam in August already. So uh, I'm incredibly grateful for this opportunity provided by the DLAB at the University of Warsaw to speak at one of these uh, Digital Europe Economic Seminars. The topic of today is mainly situated in the field of uh, journalism and news consumption, uh, but of course some interesting commentary with the other topics of the seminar, uh, seminar series is there as well, in that it deals with the societal challenges posed by uh, datafication in journalism actually. So uh, first, a little context, perhaps. Um, the advent of the internet has profoundly changed journalism, as you may all know. Today, as a news user, we have an almost inexhaustible source of information at our disposal on the World Wide Web, where and when we want it, and that with a mouse click away only. So a large part of the inf information on the internet is actually free. And when users are then still confronted with a paywall, only few users are actually willing to pay for that online news. So um, these two uh, issues, like the information abundance and the unwillingness to pay for news, make that uh, news media nowadays are struggling and are confronted with uh, declining circulation figures and advertising re uh, revenues, all of which have been exacerbated by the advent of social media as well, such as Facebook, which are cannibalizing into some of that advertising revenue as well. Uh, it has also led uh, to the public to come more in the side of journalists. So for a long time, journalism has ignored that audience, not only because they did not have the knowledge and the means to measure the audience, but also out of a certain kind of arrogance, actually. So to make quality journalism, they felt like they did not need the input of, of that audience, actually. So nowadays, they can no longer take their audiences for granted. So the battle uh, for attention is a central challenge for journalism nowadays because its public uh, role is uh, premised on connecting with an audience, uh, as is the business, a business model of private news media and the legitimacy of public service media as well, of course. So audience engagement nowadays has become a buzzword in journalism. Journalists need to engage with their audiences. And to do so, news organizations all over the world have in recent years increased their use of audience analytics um, systems, which systematically analyze uh, quantitative data on various aspects of audience behavior aimed at growing audiences, increasing engagement, and of course, improving uh, newsroom workflows. In turn, the outputs or the numbers that those systems produce are called audience metrics. So uh, throughout this presentation, I will talk about both terms interchangeably, but know that there is actually a difference. So analytics are the systems and software and metrics are their quantified output of, of these systems and software actually. So Google Analytics rather predictably has for a long time dominated the analytics space appearing on the majority of news sites. But while it was excellent at helping understand trends over time, many publishers nowadays also use analytics tools specifically developed for these newsrooms. So other popular tools specific to the news industry are, for example, uh, Chartbeat, Parsley, Adobe Analytics, Newswhip, or uh, Smart Opto. So there are several key data points and newsrooms are often most interested in. 
in terms of content consumptions, newsrooms might look at what sort of content audiences are clicking to, or the amount of time in minutes or seconds uh, visitors have spent on one site or on one uh, page in particular. Apart from these uh, consumption metrics, you also have retention metrics that measure the likelihood of uh, retraining and attracting audiences to your newsrooms, like, for example, bounce rate or uh, recirculation. But you also have uh, uh, sales figures, uh, sales metrics, which are uh, data points that represent a newsroom's performance and also shares that give an insight in the traffic coming from, for example, social media platforms such as Facebook. Uh, throughout my PhD, perhaps important to know, I only focus on these uh, consumption metrics and I will mainly talk about metrics such as page, uh, page views and time spent in uh, my talk today. So although uh, most news organizations push back against the idea that there is only like one gut metric in journalism on which news organizations should focus, uh, most newsrooms nowadays are mostly concentrated on actually these consumption metrics such as page views or time spent. However, many newsrooms, at least in Belgium, state that their key performance indicator is the conversion rate, uh, which is the percentage of users who take a desired action, like for example, buying a subscription or uh, subscribing uh, to a newsletter and such. So this is an example of how the back office of such an analytics program looks like. All uh, those different um, numbers and all these different user actions or metrics you see uh, are often aggregated and then provide some kind of picture of the popularity or the reach of a particular news article. And that uh, popularity is then often also reflected in the most read lists on uh, news websites. So this is an example of uh, uh, news uh, analytics dashboards of a Belgian media company. Um, on the right, uh, on the left, you see their own analytics dashboards, and on the right, you see the the popular homepage plugin of uh, the analytics program of Chartbeat. So, what are actually the implications of the success of articles being constantly measured? So this news item about Kim Kardashian was recently, actually yesterday, uh, I checked it, the most read or, or one of the most read articles on the website of the Daily Mail. It will perhaps not come to you as a surprise that it's mainly striking or funny news that is clicked upon more than, let's say, political or economic news. And there is therefore a growing concern actually among scholars at the increasing influence of audience of the increasing influence of these audience metrics on news selection. Many uh, scholars today fear that journalists would mainly focus on the popular news that is clicked upon a lot. And from a commercial point of view, that is, of course, um, yeah, very logical to publish mainly like funny cat videos, um, maybe some juicy gossip about celebrities and the like. But journalism, of course, has a societal role as well. Uh, besides offering what the public supposedly wants to know, there is such a thing as what it needs to know, the information that is important if a democracy is to function well. So are analytics currently being used to better understand audiences and better uh, tailor uh, news to their needs and interests? And what impact is there to see on journalistic choices in terms of news selection? That are the two questions I've uh, been grappling with for uh, four years already. So in this PG, I mainly dwell on whether one of the consequences of the increasing influence of analytics could be a potential softening of the news supply. So um, what do I mean with uh, this uh, particular softening? That the influence of those analytics could lead to the news offer shifting in the direction of more soft news topics like for example, um, celebrity, media, entertainment, lifestyle news, and also softer style. So um, bringing perhaps a harder news topic like politics, but on a more uh, sensational level or a more personalized level. So I make a distinction between news topics and news style. And I think both topics and style are shifting in the direction of softer news. So now that I uh, provided you with some background on these metrics, let me tell you what the goals of my dissertation were. I wanted to look at both the uses and the effects of analytics in journalism. And I did this on two uh, particular levels. For users, I explored how analytics are used at the editorial or news organization level, and then how that organizational use 
has uh, trickled down to the individual writing journalists on the newsroom floor. And in the third and the fourth phase of the PhD, I then set out to see what influence that news has on the perceptions and the behaviors of journalists and how it subsequently translates to the news content that we as readers are presented with. So those four research goals largely parallel with the four distinct studies that I have, uh, I have conducted. For uh, those uh, four studies, I also used four different methods actually, each of which accounts for partly answering um, my two research questions. So in addition to in-depth interviews, I used methods such as a survey, an experiment, a content analysis, which allowed me uh, to uncover both um, quantitatively and qualitatively the phenomena, uh, phenomena that I wanted to research. So I will present the general results of each of these four studies, uh, maybe without going into too many specifics, but you can of course always ask me afterwards. And I will end um, my lecture today or my presentation in this seminar with a kind of general conclusion and some recommendations for journalistic uh, practice as well. So in an initial study, I wanted to look at the use of analytics in newsrooms at an organizational level. So that study was published under the title Six Uses of Analytics, Digital Editors' Perceptions of Audience Analytics in a Newsroom. And it was published in the academic journal Journalism Practice, if you are interested in reading the full study at least. So in this study, I conducted 21 in-depth interviews with online audience and data-focused profiles, such as social media managers, digital news managers, heads of audience engagement, to gain more insight into the adoption of these tools by uh, the editorial staff or at the newsroom level. So first important finding already was that all uh, Flemish news editors in my study today use web and social media analytics. And I was able to identify at least six analytics related practices, which I will of course guide you through now. So first, web analytics are the research object of sub-editors and homepage editors who want to assign an article a place on the news websites. So these editors keep an eye on which articles are best read and move an article around when necessary. So I call this uh, story placement. This is also what these statistics are used for the most actually. So the software, um, in this case, uh, the screenshot uh, illustrates the software chart beats sketches a picture of the click and the reading behavior of audiences and ensures that homepage editors can assign an article the best possible place on a website. If an article is well read, um, yeah, illustrated in green on this slide, uh, it will be assigned a more prominent place on the website, a more higher place, a more uh, place, a more visible place uh, for news consumers. And by the way, terribly sorry that all my screenshots are in Dutch, but yeah, I just worked with, um, Flemish newsrooms uh, and I had uh, access to their uh, platforms and dashboards so that's why uh, most screenshots I, I've taken are in Dutch of course. So secondly, a second analytics oriented practice is that they also advise the Flemish news editors on the presentation or the packaging of an article. So the journalists we interviewed, for example, use analytics for amongst other things, the so-called A-B testing of headlines. Such an uh, A-B test is actually a kind of real-time experiment uh, that takes place behind the scenes of a news website. So on the slide, you can see an example of what such an A-B test looks like for the journalists uh, themselves. Uh, in the A-B test, one group of readers is then exposed to one headline, while another group is exposed to another headline, and yet uh, a third or a fourth headline in this example. So um, the journalist in this case, um, you can see that the first headline attracts the most visitors and that a reader stick with this particular article the longest. Uh, by the way, it may not come as a surprise to you that the headline with Pornhub in uh, scores the best because yeah, six cells, of course. But according to the journalist, that doesn't have to lead automatically to clickbait titles, um, they assured me. Um, because in fact, the data shows that um, these clickbait articles do not pay off as well. Readers are quickly, uh, quickly gone if a title raises expectations that a piece fails uh, to meet afterwards. So of course, 
it uh, becomes partially problematic when audience data begins to interfere with editorial choices and when journalists are judged on that basis, of course. For example, analytics are also used to select uh, future topics across all news media channels, also on Facebook, on, uh, in the newspaper, or uh, maybe in the evening uh, broadcast as well. So topics or individuals such as, for example, Elon Musk, um, the Mexit, and prior statements of Donald Trump have received overwhelming attention in the past. Because the articles uh, about them are often a hit, editors uh, feel little threshold actually about giving them attention over and over again. And that is also what analytics often recommend as a tool here on the slide illustrates. Um, you can see it, 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 it circles loads of reactions on Facebook. Are there potentially any leads for a response story or a follow up perhaps? So the analytics platform is largely steering the, the journalist decisions here on uh, future planning of stories. Another practice I could identify is the imitation of competitors' articles based on user data, and this is primarily done through social media analytics, such as CrowdTangle or Easy Insights. So a certain popular article from one title is then also published by the own title, which can, of course, lead to a dilution of the news offer because we're largely seeing the same articles appear on like every different outlets. So for the news diversity, this is maybe like a problematic use of analytics. I don't know uh, whether you uh, still remember the story of the disappearance of influencer Gabby Petito in the US. Um, it has been a while, I think uh, the, the story broke in fall, but it first appeared on the website of the popular news outlet in Belgium. And when it subsequently started to gain traction, uh, also quality broadsheets started writing about the story and this is also yeah, largely contradictive with their, yeah, th their main brand um, identity, perhaps that the, the quality broadsheets also bring this kind of articles. So, but it was picked up via social media because it gained lots of traction they saw uh, via Cartangle. Subsequently, uh, analytics also seem to create a pattern of expectations towards each journalist um, as a kind of performance measure. So although for a while public appraisal was given out to journalists at some newsrooms in the form of top five best read journalist lists distributed uh, via email, analytics uh, seem to have little or no effect on journalistic uh, compensation, the evaluation scores of journalists, or even uh, job secu security. There was an uh, exception though, it seems that only the digit, uh, the one digital only newsroom in our sample told me about some kind of evaluation scores uh, with the telling quotes that when someone is systematically digging at the bottom in terms of traffic each month, there will be some sort of uh, evaluation attached to that anyway. Whether that is dismissal, I cannot establish in the study, but uh, I think you can all agree with me that that does not sound very well for this journalist in particular. At the other editorial offices, uh, these analytics were mainly used as a motivational pat on the back and as a kind of incentive to convince newspaper journalists in particular that it really does pay off to publish digital first or audience first. So at one uh, particular newsroom, there was a pie a pie to eat that was given to a journalist with the best uh, read article of the month. And while this is, of course, um, seems like a very playful and a relatively harmless way to reconcile your journalists and your data, it can, of course, create some kind of pressure on journalists to get into these lists of popular items because executives um, yeah, motivate you to appear in these um, uh, lists as well. So we have to be cautious uh, with this particular practice of analytics, because meanwhile, the Daily Telegraph, uh, for example, announced plans to link journalists' pay with article popularity. The Herald Sun as well, Australia's largest newspaper owned by media mogul Rupert Murdoch, pays out bonuses to journalists based on the popularity of their pieces. So I think um, at this newsroom, journalists receive like a bonus between uh, five and 30 euros uh, per article for bringing in digital subscribers. But there are also other measures like um, paid shoes and unique readers that can also lead to extra payments or extra bonuses as well. So uh, added together, this can yeah 
greatly um, increase your 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 actual pay, of course. But the, the fear in this case is that such a bonus system will lead to an increased focus on topics that are already popular. Imagine that you're an author writing about sensationalist stories such as crime, and you will probably be favored over your colleagues that are writing about much drier subjects such as politics or um, yeah, maybe the world economy. So one uh, very last practice that bubbled up from the interviews is that the use of analytics, um, that analytics are used as some kind of gauge of public opinion. So until a few years ago, it was extremely difficult to gauge the opinion of your news consumers or of media users. But through these analytics, editors now know not only what devices their readers are using, but also where they live, through uh, which social media channels they arrive at news websites. And sometimes they even uh, have information about readers' age, gender, and also personal interests. And as a result, uh, many journalists can now better imagine their audience or have the feeling that they can now better imagine their audience and also feel that they like really know who their audience is and how they can better tailor their new supply to them. But can we now infer from these six practices that journalists then only uh, produce the messages that are popular? Not according to the journalists I interviewed, the knowledge of journalists, their gut feeling, and also the importance of a good news mix. So a mix of both like harder and serious topics and the softer, more entertaining topics this, they say, leads above all in the choices they make. And according to the journalist, a guiding role should be played by the editor-in-chief, who should at all time uh, guard the DNA of the title and focus on the journalistic goals and even redirect uh, these goals when journalists are maybe giving in too much into traffic. So, of course, we have to keep in mind that the interviewed news managers and web journalists use web analytics on a daily basis. So they are like very familiar with it. Whether their positive attitudes towards these analytics is also shared among all journalists is something that I've investigated in the second chapter of my PhD. So the paper can be found under the title Do Metrics Drive News Decisions? And it was published in uh, Electronic News, again, for people interested in reading the whole study and not just the main takeaways. So I conducted a survey of 231 Belgian political journalists and asked them about their use, uh, their exposure and perception towards analytics. And I'm firstly going to uh, take a little sip. So um, whereas uh, three quarters of the journalists are regularly exposed to audience metrics by their editors, a fair share of journalists is still not really familiar with using analytics themselves. Like three in five journalists never use analytics themselves. Most journalists are just passively exposed by email or um, by these screens that are uh, in the newsroom. So in most newsrooms, real-time metrics are continuously visible on large screens and they not only inform all journalists about which stories then are doing well, but they also stimulate some kind of acceptance and normalization of analytics among the newsroom staff. So what we further found in this study is that journalists who actively use analytics themselves also generally harbor more positive attitudes towards these analytics. However, when journalists are just overwhelmed with them by their editors, they can create some kind of counterproductive effect whereby the journalists are much more likely to harbor more negative attitudes and also more skepticism about their ability, the ability of analytics to improve journalistic work. So you can uh, clearly feel that there is some kind of tension being created between these regular journalists who are not so eager to use them and in contrast, um, the extremely positive image that the online editors uh, from the first study, uh, the interview study, paint to me. So a kind of disciplining ID also emerges from this study. Even if journalists themselves do not really want to use them, the information will reach them in one way or another via their editors in order to make them like more enthusiastic about using analytics themselves. However, there were some differences that can be noticed between journalists. So the less experienced journal a journalist is, 
the more likely they are to make active use or, of it or be informed about it uh, by their superiors. So a possible explanation uh, for this result could be that less experienced journalists write proportionally more for online news media, where these analytics are, of course, ubiquitous. But more experienced journalists, on the other hand, use them less themselves and are also less informed uh, about them by their news editors. So experienced journalists probably have more credit uh, for deviating from this uh, kind of editorial line and from the overall uh, newsroom traffic goals, perhaps. So against uh, a third finding, against my expectations, was that analytics were better integrated in the routines of journalists uh, working for the public service uh, broadcaster than uh, journalists working for commercial media. I also draw an expl uh, explanation for this um, result from the first study, which shows that the use of analytics at the public service broadcast is like really highly professionalized and that there is a widely supported policy on analytics that is implemented in this public service broadcaster. So then um, through an experiment in that same survey, uh, survey, I set out to see if journalists will also act upon these analytics. So the experiment was published under the title Beaten by Chartbeat, an experimental study on the effect of real-time audience analytics on journalistic uh, news judgment. And it was published in uh, journalism studies. Again, for those of you who are interested in the study. Just uh, maybe a small word of additional explanation about the experimental design of this paper. So we conducted uh, this study experiment among 136 political journalists in Belgium. They were all given the task to imagine themselves in a hypothetical situa situation of managing the homepage that they and that they were allowed to compose the news on this homepage. So in doing so, they were shown five headlines that they had to assign a place from one to five on this fictional homepage where place one was, of course, the most prominent, most visible place, and place five was the least prominent and therefore uh, most unimportant or invisible page, uh, place on the news uh, homepage. So every journalist got to read that assignment, although there was a substantial difference between the experimental and the control group. So the journalists in the control group were simply shown the five headlines and they just had to rely on their own notes for newsworthiness while the other part of the journalists in the experimental group uh, were provided with information from Chartbeats, um, which was at that time the best known analytics program in uh, Belgian newsrooms. So these journalists in the experimental group actually knew uh, which news was clicked upon well by the public. So headlines um, could additionally vary based on the type of headline. So it could either be a hard or a soft news headline could uh, vary on the basis of tone. So it could be a negative uh, news headline or a positive news headline. And uh, also on the basis of chart beat figures that could mean either rising or falling or stagnating clicks to the headline. So the experiment uh, shows that we should, first and for all, not overestimate the impact of analytics either. So traditional news values such as tone and type outweighed analytics in, in evaluating and ranking the news headline. So an initial finding was that uh, journalists generally rank the harder news headlines higher than the softer news headlines. And also negative news headlines were also ranked higher than these positive news headlines in our sample. So then there was actually an effect of metrics as well. So when journalists were faced with rising or falling metrics, so decreasing or increasing popularity to the news headlines, they take them into account to determine an article's place on the websites. So articles with a rising popularity are systematically ranked higher than in the control group, while articles with falling popularity were systematically ranked lower than the control group. So in addition, it was found that these effects of the analytics on the headline was uh, significantly greater for the soft news headline than for the hard news headline. So the soft news headline uh, with increasing popularity was ranked higher compared to the control group. Uh, it, but in contrast, the ranking of the hard news headline was not or all, uh, only barely affected by the analytics. So although an audience data are becoming more and more established in newsrooms, in Belgium at least, 
uh, for the time being, they do not seem to have like a real major impact on the political news they offer to their readers. So uh, while in the experiments, I was um, able to provide a first glimpse into the relationship of analytics and software news, in the fourth and final paper of my PhD, I've really worked towards that question of whether the use of analytics contributes now to a further softening of the news supply. So do we as readers really, or as scholars, do we really have to fear for the informational value of our news supply now? Um, and I'm happy to announce that this, uh, this article will be the leading, um, leading article in the upcoming issue of digital journalism as well. So in that paper, I studied the effects of analytics on the online news supply of five Belgian media outlets. Um, the innovative part of this um, more than 10,000 news articles counting content analysis was that I coupled the analysis of the news supply with an analysis of engagement metrics. So this allowed me to analyze which topics score well and less well and moreover, uh, it made me able to make a comparison between a news supply on the website and the news supply on Facebook. So for the analysis of the engagement metrics, I was fortunate enough to work with uh, the various media groups in Belgium and the public service broadcaster in Belgium, who all granted me access to their analytics software and dashboards. So I had metrics available for all 10,000 articles in my data sets. I finally uh, then chose to focus on two common uh, metrics. So the clicks or page views and the time spent. Remember, these were the consumption metrics I, told, uh, I talked about in like the second slide of the presentation. So uh, this time spent is generally considered like a higher quality metrics than the clicks or page views because it's me it measures how long an article is read actually. So in this article, I also assume that uh, time spent is uh, a more qualitative metric and it's linked to uh, more quality journalism. Uh, in uh, the study, I also collected Facebook likes, shares, and comments through the CrowdTangle program. CrowdTangle is a public insights tool owned and operated by Facebook, uh, which tracks publicly available Facebook pages and also the metadata each post on these pages receives. So I bring all these um, Facebook uh, metrics together under the heading of Facebook engagement in my study. So in the first part of the analysis, I started looking at what particular topics are popular and whether we can expect that there are different news offerings uh, catering to different metrics as well. So if we look at which topics score well in terms of page views, it seems that the, these are mainly uh, topics about uh, celebrities, social uh, issues, and the environment. On the other hand, news about politics, uh, science and technology, uh, and social affairs, who score significantly less in terms of page views, do much better in terms of the time spent to these topics. And on Facebook, um, lifestyle news uh, in turn collects the most likes, comments, and shares aggregated, in addition uh, to news about media and entertainment and the environment. So we then started comparing the news on the news website and news on the Facebook page of the different outlets. So you can see that only like 30% of the total news supply appears on Facebook. And we went to see whether the news supply is then more softened on Facebook in response to uh, Facebook metrics, for example, or Facebook's algorithmic logic. However, uh, the study does not paint a clear black and white picture. So although the news offering on Facebook still uh, seems to serve informational purposes by uh, providing news, uh, news users with a significant portion of harder news, there uh, still seems to be a slight shift uh, in topics and style that appear on Facebook. So compared to the news websites, the Facebook news supply uh, contains less political, economic, and foreign news. And in contrast, the presence of soft news style, uh, remember, which incorporates more elements of sensation and personalization, was also more prominently uh, available on Facebook. So do news media mostly uh, do what the metrics say, as the study is called, or, and, uh, or follow uh, what they instruct to do? 
So although uh, digital news editors uh, put the importance of analytics into perspective in the first study, it seems that metrics do influence news selection and not just the placement and uh, presentation like they uh, said to me. We can see that there is a parallel between the news that manages to achieve a lot of, uh, of clicks and interactions and the news that is subsequently distributed to Facebook. So these engagement metrics show that soft news topics and style significantly do better on Facebook. However, um, for time spent, we didn't notice the same connection. So this study did expose that the metric time spent shows different patterns and is more strongly related to hard news topics and hard news style. So although uh, news, organiza uh, news organizations shout from the rooftops that they are not chasing clicks and page views and claim that mainly time spent is the key performance indicator in the newsrooms, we do not see this uh, particularly reflected uh, in the offer on Facebook, posted on Facebook. So from a commercial point of view, again, this seems like a very logical choice since they are strongly rewarded for these decisions. Um, um, but time, if time spent were to be placed more centrally in the editorial strategies of newsrooms, this could, uh, this could therefore also yield other insights and maybe also a different news flight on Facebook or on the news website. So in short, that were the uh, four different studies that I conducted. After those four studies, uh, what can I now answer to the two questions I asked myself at the beginning of my PhD? about the uses and the consequences uh, for journalism. So from this PhD, I can uh, conclude that analytics have captured the bulk of Flemish newsrooms, Belgian newsrooms, and will not disappear immediately. Furthermore, they have also given rise to new and partly worrying practices, at least six according to the first study, but let's not overestimate their impact either. Journalists uh, seem to realize that these metrics are not the alpha and omega and are healthily skeptical. Beta, at least so they claim, uh, will never determine their choices on a one-to-one -one basis. And disappointing reach will uh, not mean uh, that news about, let's say, uh, the, the Brexit will no longer be broadcast. So although the question is, of course, whether the socialization in a metrics-driven editorial team will also keep journalists sufficiently critical, especially since these editorial staff is filling up with younger digital natives, uh, which are often very positive about metrics, according to the second study. So finally, data-driven and more audience-focused journalism seems to contribute to a kind of softening of the news supply in topics and style. But I want to nuance that softening should not necessarily be bad, provided that soft news does not equal junk news, of course, and that the user is treated not as a consumer, but also as a living citizen with his own values or his own expectations uh, about what is valuable to a journalism. So then I also formulated some kind of uh, recommendations for practice or what they should take into account or what they should get from this PhD. Uh, first, I think that journalists should be involved in the creation or the modification of in-house analytical tools and dashboards. If we want uh, journalists to take responsibility about what and how to write and which pieces to promote, we must be critical about uh, the tendency of news organizations to rely on uh, commercial audience analytics. So second, an ongoing softening of news uh, may be partially due, due to the fact that uh, sustainable sources of revenue have uh, largely stayed out of reach uh, for online journalism, with uh, news organizations' business models still largely being dri driven by advertising logic. So a shift away towards a focus on subscription models may perhaps alter the design and the use of analytics as well. Uh, and it may also entice news organizations to cultivate smaller uh, and more loyal audiences rather than maintaining um, this kind of superficial, shallow relationship with a large mass audience. And third, I like to advocate for a more, uh, or I would like to join others that advocate for a, a more qualitative user-centered approach that would facilitate um, the examination of what metrics do and do not measure, in fact, because these metrics um, suffer from a frequency and a duration fallacy. So what do I mean by that? Or what do the authors mean by that? Because I'm quoting uh, Tim Rotz-Kormeling and Professor Irene Kostramer. 
this frequency fallacy and duration fallacy is actually the misconception that what audiences consume most frequently or spend most time with is equivalent to what they find most interesting or important. This is in fact not true. Clicks cannot simply be equated with interest. Uh, time spent can also not be equated with a uh, larger interest in uh, a specific news article because there are all these kind of technological flaws that yeah maybe may lead to like a, a larger reading time. So I argue that instead of focusing on reception um, or how audiences attend to news, uh, like how much time they spend on a story or how much a story was tweeted, for example, that um, we should follow the plea of certain authors that uh, plea for um, uh, a shift towards more production oriented audience engagement, where the focus lies on how journalists attend to audiences instead of uh, how audiences attend to news. So, for example, did the audience have a chance to partake in the production of a story or how much diverse sources had uh, journalists included in their news stories? So um, there are some examples already of, of these kind of analytics companies that uh, yeah, conceptualize a more production-oriented um, approach towards engagement. For example, Hirken is a company that offers audience engagement tools and consulting to uh, many news organizations, predominantly in the US, but there are some European headquarters as well, I believe. Uh, and they conceptualize audience engagements as an ongoing process by which uh, journalists should actively listen. It's literally in the name here, can so listen here to uh, do and communicate with audiences in order to uh, earn their trust and loyalty to the news outlets. So uh, they promote like soliciting questions to the audiences or um, yeah, means to validate audience interest or like really involving the public in the reporting process or invite the public to further interact with news content. And I think um, this uh, production-oriented engagement is perhaps the way to go to solve uh, journalism's uh, trust and financial crisis. Um, so I would like uh, to thank the organizing committee again for the chance to participate and uh, speak in this seminar series. I would also like to thank the audience as well, of course, uh, for listening and for bearing with me. Uh, in Belgium, it's like really hot today and really sunny, so I don't know about your countries, but glad that you decided to stick with me instead of enjoying the weather today. Uh, I have only time for a couple of questions, but you can also send me an email uh, or reach out to me on Twitter, and I will gladly take the time uh, then to reply or discuss um, your questions with you. And I just want to... Um, show the, my literature list. So these are all the publications you can uh, search for and uh, dive into more um, extensively, perhaps. OK, thanks. Thank you very much. It's a really interesting presentation. So uh, yeah. do we have questions? questions? Please, yes, just please go ahead and unmute and, yeah, and ask. Just try if I may. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. I'm Sophia. I'm from Ilmenau University in Germany. And I found it also very interesting um, from a media economics point of view, we always have um, media bias as a theory um, for that. And, and we struggle with the problem that um, demand driven is, is that really quality or is it not? And um, I find it highly interesting to how to see how the audience reacts and to manage the attention flows. And that's why I was wondering, um, so the, the, it's the automatic analysis of consumer behavior, but is, it, is there also already an automatic reaction? So um, are there tools to which actually react to that? And because what I got from your presentation, I hope that's right, is that there's still editors um, shifting places and, and you, actual humans reacting to that. And, and I was wondering if there is um, also uh, algorithmic solutions um, and what might bias next or lead to next new, um, further biases. And if there's, so there's, that's one question. And the second question would be if there's relative measurement. So the length of text and the time they spend reading it, because maybe um, they don't need too much time to read the whole text and still enjoy reading the whole text and actually finish the text. Um, so I was wondering about that. And thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you so much for your question. I think I'm going to answer your second question first. So uh, newsrooms also have a metric uh, that's called engage time. And this uh, yeah, really is like active involvement with the page. So not just leaving your uh, tab open, but engage time uh, really refers like to scrolling and it measures like how much you're engaging with the page. Are you still reading? Are you still scrolling uh, on the page? Uh, page? So that's uh, a more relative measurement of okay. this uh, time mm -hmm. spent. Mm -hmm. Then uh, with regards to your first question, so my uh, PhD mainly dealt indeed with like the manual editorial decision-making and not uh, really with like personalization because uh, news personalization is also largely uh, based on user metrics. And I know, um, from my context with, um, for example, Belgian newsrooms, that there are some kind of personalization systems implemented on the news page that, um, yeah, that feature some algorithm uh, algorithms that that yeah that make like a personalized news page for you, and this is based on your prior user behavior, of course. Yeah. Uh, but they have some kind of um, buffer still because uh, one of the 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 inventors, let's say, about a personalization system said like when I just leave the algorithms be, then the the, the personalized news page is just filled with uh, soft rubbish news. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm come from from an audio visual kind of context, and um, then we have the same thing, right? It's it's the personalization, and depending on your preferences, if you have very homogeneous preferences, you just get the same information all the time if you of course if you have heterogeneous preferences you might get more variation but that's um a big deal of i think perception of quality is is um the the um variety and um yeah definitely yes i i definitely agree um so for most newsrooms um it's still done largely uh, manual like this mm -hmm. signing on the pages but yeah um lots of newsrooms are experimenting with it with a kind of personalized page or how preferences can be uh, more put into the, the home pages uh, for each new school and consumer in particular. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Uh, I wanted to ask, if I may, so, uh, you mentioned it as one of the recommendations that, uh, to try different types of monetization, right? And I've been wondering if uh, you also have any data that could be compared from like news uh, media that use, I don't know, paywalls or something, whether, whether they also use the metrics after all, or whether the usage is not there or, yeah. Yes, I, I wanted, I don't have any data, but I wanted to, um, yeah, have like alternative outlets in my interview sample to know how they use analytics because, for example, the digital only news medium Apache in Belgium uh, only works with uh, donations and memberships. So this kind of alleviates commercial pressure, of course, on journalists, uh, which is why they would maybe not attach that much importance to metrics. But I yeah, I have nothing to compare actually, but yeah, we know for the fact that it alleviates commercial pressure that they still use metrics, but in other ways, uh, for example, uh, focusing more on conversions. Um, so like when you users take a desired action or buy a subscription or when they, um, when they uh, yeah, what kind of articles um, they like to read most and such. But yeah, I, I can't really give an extensive answer because I did not really investigate this, but I, I sure think there is an influence actually and in that we found, uh, find different uses um, if you you uh, rely on different business models um, and maybe less on advertising logic. Okay, thanks. That's, that's something really interesting, right? I mean... Yes. First, that you would look at different metrics, and then well, okay. <laughs> I guess uh, it, uh, it would be possible that still they would uh, like make their judgments based on these metrics, and it would lead back to the uh, same problem. Or do you think? Uh, yeah, the thing is that um, when you just want to cater uh, to a large, the largest audience as possible, that you just rely on these consumption metrics such as page use and try to uh, increase these page use. 
while when you're just focusing on a loyal audience or a niche audience then yeah you don't need to increase like all your metrics you just need to increase maybe like the the most relevant metrics for you but i think there is just a distinction between catering to a, a small niche but loyal audience or catering to the largest audience as possible for your newsroom if okay. that answers your question yeah yeah of course thank you do you have other questions perhaps i have one more but i can wait okay so perhaps last question for me is uh, I'm also wondering after your presentation uh, if, whether it's possible to check if uh, these metrics and not only affect, for example, the positioning and uh, the, the, the topics themselves, but also the length and the content of the news. Is it, would it be possible to analyze it this way? Yeah, I know for a fact um, that one of the Belgian newsrooms is actually. Um, experimenting with like the different characteristics of a news article so the dna of a news article uh so to say uh, and this um yeah dna is composed of different structures like for example the links or maybe also actors included in the news message but also the format of a news article like is it an interview is it an opinion piece is it uh yeah a long news report for example so these are definitely features that um yeah, should uh, be elaborated more to see um, which features um, are maybe attracting most traffic or what's the ideal composition of a news articles and how can we, for example, drive um, uh, audiences also to like the, the more boring political news if we just tune the features of a news article. So yeah, that's definitely worth delving into. Uh, I want to do that in my postdoc proposal. So uh, I want to do an automated content analysis of these uh, different features and how they relate to audience engagement. So, but that this is still to come. That would be great to read it at some point. Okay, you know, when, it's, when I'm that far, I will send you the papers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is I, I sometimes read these pieces on some entertainment media, like, I don't know, TV shows or something, and the tendency I've been noticing is that, the, well, the headlines tend to get more clickbaity, and then uh, often, you know, they don't answer, like, what the article is about, and then you have to go through a lots of text before you actually reach what this is supposed to be about like they first provide you with the backstory and some history and some other context and then only refer to what they actually said in the headline <laughs> yeah so. yeah i know that many uh, audiences are are tuning out from news if if they see this kind of headline so i think it's yeah very worth uh, delving into how audiences react to news headlines and it's not always better to have like this real teasing title that cannot meet the expectations of an audience member. In your case, it didn't meet up with your own expectations. So yeah, journalists need to consider that, of course. Uh, but it's, of course, there is a difference between a clickbait title and just a teasing title um, to, to lure your audiences to your news websites. I think that's an important difference where clickbait, uh, clickbait really is, um, yeah, titles that, yeah, are just not covering the whole piece and where you are left uh, disappointed as an audience member, whereas a teasing article can be just a quote integrated in the piece, uh, but then highlighted in the t a title, for example. All right. Okay. Uh, do we have any other question? If not, then I would like to thank you again very much for the presentation and thanks everyone for coming and for being with us for the Beacon seminars and hopefully we'll see each other again uh, in the next academic year. And yeah, thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and don't hesitate to reach out if you have any further questions. Thank you.